Welcome everyone to the initial session of the Greenfield Cities Alliance Dialogues 2021, uh, a, a joint presentation brought to you by, the, by New Cities. And in the case of next month's event, our second installment, Cornell Tech uh, in New York City. So it's my pleasure to be your host, Greg Lindsay, uh, to introduce this first session on sort of looking at the past, present, and future of Greenfield cities, where they have been, where they are presently, and where they could potentially go. Um, because those of you who followed New Cities programming for some time know that I think it was about six years ago now that we launched the Greenfield Cities Alliance as a, a sort of network for practitioners of the art of building cities from scratch, uh, a unique fraternity, one might say, uh, to bring them together to basically see what they could learn from each other in the travails of building uh, master Greenfield urbanism. Um, and of course, during this time, over the last, with say 15 years or so, beginning with the advent of Mazdar Institute to Mazdar City in Abu Dhabi, continuing through the smart city boom of the, of the late aughts uh, into the early 2010s, and then of course continuing to the present uh, with a handful of projects uh, that are on the books. We have Peter Terriam from Neom here as well, and also new cities being built from scratch in Egypt, Indonesia, and beyond as new capital cities. Um, the, the questions await us. We have, we have 15 years of, of knowledge now. What have we learned? What can we do better? And where should these projects go? And what, of course, is the point of a greenfield city in 2021? So with that, it's my pleasure to introduce our panelists for today. Uh, joining us first is uh, Dr. Sarah Moser, Associate Professor of uh, Geography at McGill University. Sarah, due to this uh, confluence here of Zoom World, will be showing herself out in 45 minutes or so to another conference in Kyoto. We'll teleport there. So please direct any questions you have for Dr. Moser first. First. Um, we're also being joined, uh, a late edition, uh, Dr. Uh, Gukia Gunel, who is the author of Spaceship in the Desert, uh, a critical ethnography of Mazdar itself, which was published last year. She joins us as an assistant professor in anthropology from Rice University today. Uh, also joining us is Dr. Anthony Townsend, uh, who is the urbanist in residence at Cornell Tech, who's joining us uh, as part of our partnership there. Uh, Dr. Townsend, of course, uh, is literally wrote the book on smart cities, as well as his more recent book, Ghost Road, uh, and you know, more than a decade ago, did a particular study of South Korean mega projects, uh, in, you know, in particular Songdo and others. Uh, and then finally, our practitioner here on the panel uh, is, I assume, Dr. Peter Terriam. I assume we all have doctorates here. Uh, Peter is the head of energy, um, make sure I get the full, uh, full attribution here, the managing director of energy, water, and food at NIAM, which of course is perhaps the most eagerly anticipated greenfield city of them all in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and before that, Peter was the CEO of, of RWE and it's been out uh, energy, which is of course one of the largest renewable energy generators in Europe. Um, so I think we're gonna have a great session here to basically discuss uh, yeah, again, what have we learned? What lessons are applicable from this first or second or however many generations of Greenfield Cities projects we have and carrying them forward into the next decade? So this is the part where I tell you to please leave your questions in the Q&A. We hope to get into, uh, to weave them in in the second half of the talk. But for now, let's get started. And so I'd like to address my first question to, uh, to Sarah. I'll use your first names on the panel today. Um, because uh, part of the direction of this panel was inspired by a conversation that Sarah, had, Sarah and I had this summer uh, in which she pointed out that um, at this point in the evolution of greenfield cities, we can no longer say that these are interesting pilot experiments. We have the data, we have seen the projects, the results are in, and it's time to take sort of an honest accounting of where they've been. So Sarah, I guess in your estimation at this point is, what is the point of a greenfield city? What, what are the lessons? What is their track record? And yeah, why should we continue to build urbanism from scratch? Is there any compelling reason to do so at this point? And, and yeah, what are sort of the, the strands that we can pull out of the projects of the last 15 years or so? Greg, you asked me like five questions. So you can choose which one you like and just sort of go from there. <laughs> I, I mean, I think there's something perpetually seductive about the idea of building from scratch and sort of working out all the problems in existing cities and creating a place that is free of all the congestion and pollution and all the problems that plague our cities. Uh, and I think that combined with the beautiful computer generated models that we see now make it incredibly seductive for the average person, the average policymaker, um, the average investor. Um, so there is sort of a shine on new cities still, um, despite a lot of failures. Uh, and, you know, I've been in this long enough that now I'm starting to see projects rise and fall <laughs> within uh, several short years. So I can talk about some of the failure uh, reasons for the failures. Um, I mean, there are many reasons and every project is its own kind of complicated beast. Um, but I think I, I can point to at least, you know, four or five failure uh, reasons for failures. 
Uh, and the first is is the inexperience of a lot of, of city city builders. Um, it's a huge project that most people don't have uh, the expertise to, to tackle. Um, it's not just like building a bridge or a dam or a, a building. Um, it's incredibly complicated and, and really not easy projects to build. Um, the second one, I think, is the imagination versus reality gap. Um, and so the dreamers and visionaries of, of uh, new cities are not necessarily those who actually have to construct them. Um, and so the, the rich imaginations of all these people from McKinsey and from architecture firms and whatnot uh, produce these beautiful, seductive, computer-generated images uh, that, that are really hard to build, if not impossible to build. Uh, and so I think it gets people really excited to see these images, and then they're inevitably disappointed by what actually happens. And so what we're seeing right now in my research and in the research of my graduate students is kind of this mass disappointment where they said, you know, local people are saying, well, we were promised X, Y, Z, and it's either happening incredibly slowly or the project's been modified beyond recognition. Um, and so this is sort of what people are grappling with right now. Um, for example, there's one city that has, you know, tens of thousands of people, but uh, there's no garbage pickup and there's no public transportation system. And, you know, all of these growing pains are very real for the people who live there. And it generates some pretty bad media attention. And then quickly, the, the third, I would say, is real estate. We all know real estate is... Uh, an important investment vehicle, particularly for international investors. And so a lot of these projects have been pitched towards wealthy foreign investors or local domestic investors who are already own multiple homes. Um, or they're targeted at sort of a non-existent middle class, which in many countries doesn't really exist yet. Uh, so a lot of these projects haven't been filled in according to plan and the properties have maybe even been sold as investments, but not as homes. So they're just sort of sitting there empty. Uh, and then the fourth, I think, reason for failure is this sort of uh, Silicon Valley fake it till you make it attitude in a lot of new cities projects where they don't actually have a game plan. They don't actually have investment, <laughs> uh, but they forge ahead anyway, hoping that if they create enough beautiful images it'll all sort of fall into place. Uh, and it doesn't always fall into place as we know. Um, and then the fifth one is the changes in power have proven really challenging for a lot of these projects. So politicians come and go, you know, royalty died and are replaced. Uh, and this means that the sort of initial strong advocates of uh, projects are, are, are no longer there. And so the projects can lose momentum and lose support. So some projects come to be seen as legacies as per, of particular, a particular leader. And when that leader's out of the picture, no one really has the will to push the projects through. So, I mean, those are, that's just a sample of some of the challenges I think that we're facing. All right, great. Now that, now that we've got all of those reasons out of the way, we can sort of delve into what, what we can learn from them going forward and whether there's any rays of hope there. But but you mentioned there about Silicon Valley sort of sheen there. I would have turned to Anthony now in this because one of Anthony's more recent projects, uh, he was an, an early consultant on Sidewalk Toronto, which was the Sidewalk Lab subsidiary of Alphabet attempt to build a, a smart city, of course, on the waterfront of Toronto, which faced fierce uh, you know, pushback from local residents. Um, but also, interestingly enough, you know, Sidewalk moved on from that project, canceling it in May 2020, I believe, um, uh, by now pivoting into just building other pieces of infrastructure, spinning out some other companies. And Anthony, the question I have from you from that and from your other studies is, are, are urban mega projects really the best unit of analysis going forward? Should we be thinking about smart cities or greenfield cities as entire urban districts that must be built at once? Or is the way forward, or it seems to have been over the last decade or so that you know that what we think of as smart cities have been these entire networks deployed across many cities at once. And so I'm curious your thoughts on like, what are the advantages of greenfield urbanism from a technological standpoint at this point? Yeah, I mean, I think that the really novel contribution that Sidewalk made in Toronto um, it was a big leap forward in terms of the depth and level of integration of urban systems that they proposed. It was probably the single most valuable piece of the entire scheme. Um, and it never really, I think, got the serious scrutiny that it deserved because there were so many other problems with the project that kept coming back to, to really, you know, sort of 
create what Bianca Wiley called a tire fire um, that really distracted attention from, from both the underlying um, advantages and the and underlying kind of structural problems of how the public-private partnership was made. Uh, a lot of attention was paid to some of the sort of um, user interface and public surveillance aspects of the project, um, which are, are actually better in many cases than a lot of other similar proposals going on around the world, and certainly better than industry practice. But what never got real attention was the the depth of integration between things like water systems and waste systems and lighting and heat generation, um, all of which had been building code, um, things that are really um, pretty outdated in most parts of the world uh, and don't take advantage of new technology. So I think to that extent, you know, the question you're asking is still an open question. There's still an opportunity for a greenfield project or a brownfield project, which is really what, what uh, Toronto was, to come along and say, look, we're going to um, design a city from scratch. We're going to put just as much attention to the the what's sort of behind the scenes as the glossy renderings of, of the buildings that we're going to build. Um, and you know, we think we have a business there. We think it's in the public interest to do this um, because it can help work towards some policy goals like carbon emission reductions. Uh, securing infrastructure, which is going to be a big deal as we go forward, um, and I think you know it just it's it's really still still an open challenge that others can come along and and pick up. Great. Well, I mean, speaking of of you know integrated systems, and this brings me to uh, to uh, to Gookie, uh, which is Mazdar, of course, and you know Central Toronto and, and Mazdar City, and I've only visited once in passing, but it struck me as they suffer in in many ways the, the same problem as Songdo in South Korea, one of the other great models of this. Which is that they ended up being sort of toy models. You know, they were they were integrated systems, but they were just tiny little pockets of things, while growth patterns in the general world continued on unabated. And and Goki, I mean, you could talk a bit about obviously about your book and your your ethnography there. And I'm sort of curious your thoughts on again what were the sort of flaws in Mazdar? That was the one that struck me at the time. Is you know they built all the sort of clean energy pilots, but you know there was a giant car park outside where we visited, and there was a hyper there was a Carrefour hypermarket built in part of the plan. So it sort of seemed like it was just simply a, a bauble in the desert but I you know what are the lessons we can learn from from that project I thank you for your question um my one of the I think the issues with the Mazdar project was how it was conceived as uh, what I call in the book a spaceship in the desert basically and that's not my phrasing uh that's actually the phrasing of one of the students who went to Mazdar Institute but the uh, but the idea of a spaceship in the desert became very popular for different communities who were participating in the project. And one of the things that I did in the book was to ask why this idea is so popular. And, and, I, and I found out as I uh, talked to different kinds of people and um, that the idea of a spaceship as this kind of technological solution to all kinds of uh, urban problems uh, that can be insulated um, that can be sort of managed by astronauts, meaning experts or, uh, you know, who are only who are able to occupy the spaceship and who have the capacity to maneuver it was the kind of the expectation of a city. So and most of the cities that we inhabit or that we know of are not necessarily spaceships that are so regimented and that are run by experts or that only allow experts in. Uh, they are um, spaces of um, serendipity in most cases. And so uh, but but the ideal of Mazdar City was not necessarily that kind of serendipity. It was a more of a sort of a space that's managed and that a space that's um, technocratic. And and what that meant was that the boundaries around the city were um, uh, quite tightly drawn. So again, a spaceship is not necessarily a a, a, a vehicle that anyone can just uh, you know. Uh, informally enter uh, or informally inhabit. So, uh, so the, uh, the existence of those boundaries meant that the city would become what you'd call like a toy model, basically. Uh, but I don't, I don't think necessarily the people who were designing or building it saw this as a flaw of the project. Instead, it was, I think, something that people were uh, proud of or that they were trying to establish uh, further or that they were trying to implement uh, as imagined because uh, because a spaceship in the desert uh, is a basically a city that uh, is non-contextual it can be built anywhere 
uh, and it can exist as a commodity on its own. It can be exported to any part of the world and it can pop up in, you know, well, in this case, it was in the desert and there are, of course, it's not non-contextual, right? I mean, there are, oh, there's the Abu Dhabi's oil wealth is mainly the reason why the city is able to be built in the place where it is being built, where it was being built. And, uh, but, but the aspiration is to draw that, that's to, imagine that that context is not necessarily there and to imagine the city as being non-contextual. So uh, that's, I think that's the main, that's the main sort of the uh, characteristic of Mazdar city that might, might be a little bit different from all the others. Um, oh, interesting. Yeah, I never thought of it that way in the sense of it's, um, yeah, it's a self-containment was, it was meant to be an asset on the flaw in that case. Well, Peter, I think you're waiting patiently. I, I'm reminded of the, one of my favorite Simpsons quotes that it's easy to criticize and fun too. Uh, but you are the practitioner on the panel here. And I'm curious, you know, having, having studied all these examples, I'm sure, and of course, uh, you know, the GCC has other, you know, cities built from scratch. Uh, you know, the Greenfield Cities Alliance launched in Cake, King Abdullah Economic City, which is part of a previous generation of Saudi megacities uh, being built as Greenfield projects. But Peter, given your particular expertise in energy, one, I'm curious your thoughts, if you could first explain, you know, quickly what NEOM's renewable energy strategy is, because I feel like there's a lot of misconceptions around the project and its aims. Uh, and second, yeah, how do you avoid this problem of being a self-contained entity? Uh, this is where your expertise at RWE, I imagine, comes in about how that system then gets tied back into the grid and how the city can influence the country, perhaps. But but yeah, if you could talk a bit about, uh, you know, sort of NEOM and, and its goals from your perspective to start, that would be great. Yeah, thank you, Greg. Let me start with that. But but first, let me point out, you, you've already said I'm a practitioner, which means I'm not a doctor. I don't have one. And Nowadays in Germany, you have to be very careful in inheriting a doctor's title without uh, uh, having uh, deserved it. So uh, just for the record. But uh, no, it's indeed a lot of points that have been mentioned. And, and, and energy is an interesting business because it links to all of those aspects. And let me first of all say that Neom is not a city of the future. It's a land of the future. And that's a clear distinction to the latest speaker because uh, the size of Neom is as big as uh, Massachusetts or Belgium or mecklenburg vorpommern Yeah, depends where your reference is. So it is clearly more than just a spaceship yeah, that has consinct boundaries. It goes much further, it's much bigger. And that also taps into, before I zoom into the city as itself, um, one of the important concepts of what we try to realize is livability. I mean, we always say uh, uh, ancient cities or existing cities are built for cars and not for people. Uh, and that's one that I missed on uh, the list of Sarah. Uh, I'm not sure whether it deserves a place on that list, but it's a different way of looking at a city as a community, as a place where people need to feel well, yeah? well-being, livability. But uh, that comes again back to the boundaries. People don't like to be locked in in a city. And that's where I started with saying Neum is a land uh, because the interaction with the environment and what is around there is as important as the city itself. So I don't think you can just copy and paste the blueprint and put it irrespectively somewhere else in the world if the context, the environment, the nature, uh, and the access to that nature uh, in a sustainable way is not ensured as well. But that just as a, as a side remark, uh, let me then zoom into uh, to cities and, uh, and getting into uh, to my area of expertise. Uh, next to that cities are built for cars, um, the legacy of cities is that they are built for a AC system, alternate current. And if you look at nowadays renewable energy systems, but also if you look at uh, the usages, whether it's a PC, a television, or even batteries in an electric car, we are converting DC electricity on solar panels to AC, to then transport it, to convert it back to DC. That doesn't sound very smart, yeah? And it was never intended to be, but starting from scratch, not having that heritage, allows you to have a completely different look at uh, uh, this uh, situation. And the other thing to mention is we already used the word smart. I, I've not yet ever found a good definition of what a smart city is. I would say everything which is not a stupid city must be smart. But uh, what we see is a different way of interaction between people and the, call it IT or virtual or technical environment. And that is where energy taps in again. And it's not a standalone development. It is one that you see and it goes across the border, uh, whether it's telecommunication, whether it is uh, uh, video conferencing or gaming, but also the energy world as it becomes more complex. Uh, we have distributed energy, we have batteries, 
We have electrification, whether it's electric cars or other devices that we didn't have in the past. It's all becoming more volatile, more unpredictable. And it means that we need to include much more intelligence in the setup of uh, cities or uh, blocks or houses. And that is one of the keys for the solution. Now, we talk about cascading grid of smart grids. Uh, we're talking about uh, all these applications that you need anyway for other purposes, but where uh, energy can link into. And that is a key to the solution of the problem because there's not one uh, uh, solution that fits all. We will not have a large city with all the uh, energy that it needs generated in the house or, or at the house. You know, uh, It's gonna be a combination of central, decentral, interaction between those and the complexity of that needs a lot of smartness or call it artificial intelligence, big data and the IT infrastructure uh, to manage all of that. So that's a bit in the key of the concept of what we are doing. And that, that, that links into, when we talk livability, the question is livable for whom? Uh, for what kind of people? And uh, one of the punchlines for, uh, for NEOM is that uh, we, uh, we want to become an accelerator of human progress. So we're looking for the next and the after next generation and the demands that they have. So not building a city for the retired resident that wants to have its second, third or fourth home, but creating communities of people that bring the greatest minds, uh, greatest talents to NEOM to help to develop and shape their own future. And then you talk about people that want to be in control, want to be discussing on ice height with the environment, the IT, the technical environment that they are in. That's the kind of the thinking behind how we are uh, cracking the nut or wanting to crack the nut going forward. And, and I respect, I mean, Sarah has mentioned a lot of the problems and we will study them all. And, and I always say we need to avoid the, 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 the mistakes that have been made because there's so many new mistakes we can still make, you know, and we're looking forward to it, but we want to build something that has the attitude of uh, uh, interacting and uh, uh, approaching those mistakes and trying to solve them. Well, a quick follow-up question to that, Peter, then, I mean, the, I mean, one question I have obviously is, is why, <laughs> why build NEOM at all? I mean, in the sense of it sort of, you know, in its scale, it, it operates between city level and obviously there'll be an urban core to it. And as you said, it's the size of Belgium. It is national level size. So my question is, is, is why, yeah, why pursue it as a standalone project versus sort of trying to apply national policies for renewable energy as part of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia's Vision 2030, for example. Like, for example, um, I, I think of like the German Energiewende, right? Where there, it was a, a national policy to do an energy transformation. What are the advantages of doing an energy transformation in NEOM first? And then how do you transition that to the rest of the country again, so that it's not, you know, uh, autonomous pods run by renewables to nowhere? How, how do you make sure those lessons diffuse? Because that's been one of the problems, I think, of many greenfield cities. A uh, very good question, and, and, and let me tap uh, into my experience in Germany. They have in the last 20 years trying to implement as much renewables as possible and went completely overboard. You know, there's people saying the amount of subsidies that has been put in rooftop solar has basically created the solar industry in China. So they went completely overboard. Still nowadays, they only have 40% renewables in their energy mix, despite all the efforts that they've done. That gives you a kind of an explanation of how difficult it is to rebuild an existing system. Creating something new from scratch is, is easier uh, in a certain expect. It has other difficulties, but it is, is to a certain expect easier. So let me just, just leave that as a prompt note. The other one I would like to refer back to is uh, NRWE. Changing the company and bringing innovation in the company is very difficult to do within a large complex system, what a 65,000 people company is. So when you want innovation, you start with innovation at the edges. That is where it can survive. That is where it's not being immediately killed by the autoimmune system of a large complex organization. And that is where it communicates between the outside world because innovators speak a different language. They have a complete different uh, time part of development. I always said, you know, the time between getting a board paper prepared and approved by the board at RWE is the time between starting a startup and going bankrupt. So uh, you, have to, you have to start innovation at the edge or at the fringes. And then when it has created or it has remained a certain resilience, a certain maturity, then you can copy and paste and bring it into a larger system. So I see Neom as a kind of a catalyst, a catalyst for change where we can, I wouldn't say 
not only experiment, but really build up and build out things that then can be then copy and pasted to the rest of Saudi. And that is the one more theoretic version of it. There's a practical version to it. First of all, livability, you talk about climate. You know, and, um, I'm more the Eskimo kind of a guy as the uh, uh, hot temperature kind of a guy. You know, the neon area is 10 to 11 degrees cooler than the average in the uh, Middle East, but that is an advantage. Yeah. Second uh, thing is that uh, talking about a 100% renewable system, what is necessary for creating a sustainable environment, you cannot by today do that with only solar. You need wind to cover the night and the evening. And Neom is one of the locations that has uh, top five, if not top three, wind availability in the world. And, and the only one in Saudi that has this kind of wind profile. Uh, so that's another reason why you need to do it and need to, uh, to step and uh, start here. And then if, if, if you want to attract the best talents, the greatest minds, they, they are not, you know, they don't have a passport. They come from everywhere. And Neom is located, you know, within four hours, you reach 40% of the world. It's two and a half hours flight to, uh, to home, four and a half hours to London. Uh, and in the same two and a half, three hours, you are in Dubai or you are in, in Singapore. So location is also a reason for picking uh, Neom where it is. And I'm, uh, uh, I mean, I can go on and on. I mean, uh, talk about the high speed internet connections from Asia to Europe. They go past the Red Sea, just in front of our house door. We can tap in and we have uh, high speed, uh, best availability of uh, all the internet needs that we have. I'll stop you there, Peter, because it is it is interesting, the arguments then about the centrality of it. It is an interesting contrast then between that and Mazdar. If Mazdar was meant to be a repeatable commodity that, that uh, to make the argument that Neom could only exist there. Um, but but, uh, but yes, and I, I also should note that you know Keller Easterling has a great critique and I think an extra statecraft where many of the Greenfield Cities projects always argue that they're at the center of the world, which is something else we can interrogate. But first I wanna come back to, I wanna, Peter, you brought up uh, that, that diffusion theory of innovation when it comes to governance is something I would like to go back to my panels to critique because that's one of the other tropes that has percolated over the last decade plus. This is Paul Romer's notion of charter cities, the idea that we can use cities as instruments to transplant rules and institutions uh, or I should just say rules because institutions are much harder into these sort of zones. And this is of course the, the logic of, you know, the Zeds in Honduras and other projects like that. Sarah, I'd like to go back to you in this is, is you know, I'm curious again in your research, uh, since it's fairly broad, you know, have we seen examples of this or, or other projects where we can actually see a sort of transplanted set of rules, whether it's, you know, total governance or whether it's other systems, but this has been one of the classic arguments, uh, you know, that, that I had Paul Romer himself make to me that, you know, that cities become this sort of, uh, you know, Petri dish of experimentation that can then expand to the host. Keller Easterling and others have actually pushed back on this, citing UN statistics that special economic zones actually inhibit growth, economic growth around them. But, you know, is there is there a way forward with this? How can, how can we take that? Peter, Peter's trying to build it. Are, are there other examples that we can draw from or, or, or yeah, to, to point the way forward there? It's a good question. I think we're, it's still too early in the phenomenon to really have good results. Um, I, I don't see it happening anywhere. It, I sort of see these New city projects having their own, you know, uh, their own laws and their own kind of way of doing things, and it doesn't spill over. Um, it tends to just sort of stay within the city. But again, it's we need a few more decades to really see how this is going to play out. Um, but so far, I haven't seen it in uh, over a hundred new city projects. I haven't seen any sort of spillover. I think what we have seen is that uh, the new city project can attract poor people who find jobs in the new city project, uh, but they can't afford to live in this new city. And so they're actually flocking to the periphery uh, where land is cheaper and we're seeing vibrant towns emerging <laughs> uh, outside of the new city projects, which, which still tend to be fairly quiet. Um, but I would be cautious about assuming that this sort of magic of diffusion is necessarily gonna happen. It may happen. Um, but it may not. Well, yeah, a great point on the, just the urbanism aspect there. I remember my first visit to Songdo in 2007 and being startled by the fact that, you know, everything up to the, the edge of the site had been built up. So therefore the instant city was outpaced by urbanism uh, on its edges, um, which I thought was fascinating. Um, uh, Goke, I, I would love to turn to your case in this because obviously this, you know, this idea of Mastar as a site for experimentation began even before the city itself began as urbanism. And I'm curious again, in your field research there, how did the UAE officials see themselves as becoming a test bed for renewable and see themselves in the context of UAE institutions and the transition to a clean energy economy? 
Yeah, I think um, maybe it's important to remember uh, Mazdar's neighbors uh, and answering this question. So Mazdar city is situated right next to the Abu Dhabi airport and there's a, the Formula One tracks are on the other side. And then the, um, there's a, a golf course on the other side of the basically it, basically this is these are the surrounding neighbors of Mazdar and at first sight people who see the map say oh this is such a big contradiction on formula one tracks are not necessarily eco-friendly and Mazdar is trying to be eco-friendly but exactly Ferrari world and uh, and uh, and the but but from the perspective of the decision makers who uh, built all who envisioned all these infrastructures they're all uh, serving to sort of an advance um, uh, Abu Dhabi's sort of, uh, you know, experiments regarding what, what's going to happen when the oil runs out or becomes less valuable. So these are all opportunities or options uh, of what the future is going to look like. So is the future going to be rooted in a Ferrari world or is it going to be a sort of a tourism based uh, future or is it going to be a renewable energy and clean technology based future? Or, so they're all kind of laid out side by side uh, as test beds for what what the future uh, economic sort of engine of of the UAE will be. So in some sense, yes, they are contradictory. Sort of uh, perhaps if you think about their climate change and energy related goals or their uh, impacts, uh, but uh, but as uh, strategies for post oil growth. Uh, they share this kind of experimental logic with each other. Great, thank you. And then, I mean, Anthony, I'm curious your take on this as well. Um, I mean, uh, Sidewalk was a slightly different case in that in that particular point. But even then, you know, Justin Trudeau shaking hands with Eric Schmidt, who was then the, I believe, chairman of Alphabet, you know, was seen as sort of a national project. I'm also curious your, your take on sort of what we learned from Korea, because I mean, there, I mean, I mean, Songdo, I know that's not your core expertise, but Songdo was explicitly positioned as a sort of post-financial crisis 1998 experiment as a way to bring in foreign direct investment and new modes of Western neoliberalism to break the hold of the Chables. And there that project sort of ended with the Chables chasing the American developers out of Korea. So um, I'm curious, you know, have you seen any particular models in your research? And this was, I think, part of your project with new New Century Cities with Mike Joroff at MIT a decade ago as well. But you know, how should we see these as national projects that can you know be bring new ways of, of learning and being into countries? Yeah, I mean, I th I think the question you're getting at is like how effective are these as models? And the discussion has been whether they become essentially magnets or models domestically within the countries that they take place. And I think that has not been successful. What they've been is models for other mega projects. And in a lot of ways, there's sort of a layer of these projects that are really keying off of each other rather than um, you know, becoming like aspirations for, for emulation domestically. There's a whole set of other projects um, often alongside or within some of the ones that we've been talking about. So in Korea, the Seoul Digital Media City Project, which was actually much closer into central Seoul directly adjacent to the area um, in, the, in the early 2000s where the IT industry was really booming in Western Seoul and it was kind of a natural path of expansion, championed not by national authorities, but by the new metropolitan government of Seoul. Um, in Abu Dhabi, uh, 2454, uh, which was a smaller project than Mazdar, but was um, focused on developing a media hub um, for Arabs, by Arabs, and with a very explicit focus on youth media. And that has actually been quite successful. Um, and so in addition to, you know, all the glossy renderings, they also had a very well thought through story about why that city was being built and a whole um, system of entrepreneurship and education and venture finance that went along with that. Um, so it was much about building a new industry, a new industry cluster, as it was about building um, building a, a city, a physical real estate development. And I think that's like where these things have been most interesting is when there's a really compelling narrative about social economic transformation that is, is genuine and has a lot of buy-in. Um, and Sarah mentioned a really important point, which was the sort of lack of continuity of leadership in a lot of these projects and that that's like a big Achilles heel for them. And one of the things that we've identified in some of these smaller but still big projects um, is, is that there's usually someone what Mike Joroff at MIT calls a master integrator. 
someone who's not necessarily the owner of the project, but is the person who's constantly running around, making sure that everyone knows what everyone else is doing and is sort of marching over the years towards, towards the same goal. Um, you know, and the most successful projects have been ones where that person becomes institutionalized as a leader and a visionary for the project. Interesting. Well, that brings us back to Peter then. Uh, you know, I mean, the, the point about leadership and continuity. I mean, so I, in light of these uh, remarks upon the sort of other projects, Peter, um, how are you working with the government of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia to make sure that NEOM is integrated back into national institutions? I mean, obviously, in this case, um, again, my understanding from the outside, the Public Investment Fund is the major backer of the project. The PIF is controlled by the Crown Prince, who has personally invested in this project, appeared in the launch of the line, is a young ruler in waiting. So it seems like you'd have that continuity. But are you having talks with your counterparts in the larger institutions of Saudi Arabia to make sure that NEOM does uh, diffuse? I mean, I, I guess going back to your metaphor there about innovation uh, as a CEO and innovation at the edge, how do you bring that back into the core for a nation state so that NEOM can succeed where all these other stranded projects sort of failed or fizzled? Yeah, there are many facets uh, uh, that tie into this here. And, and you've mentioned one, there's a clear leadership and that leadership is visionary and uh, is personally involved. You know, it's not a kind of a ceremonial involvement, but, uh, but really very intensively involved. You see that because the announcement of, for instance, the line, but also the announcement of Neom as such was done uh, by the Crown Prince himself at the uh, FII or uh, in the internet. So that's one starting point. The other point that I, I, I can refer to is if you look at our board, the board of NEOM, that includes quite a number of ministers, you know, uh, and you could tap also on <clears throat> that as a sign of involvement and uh, clearly uh, hands-on uh, 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 guidance and support of what we are doing in, in NEOM. And that, that goes broader than only the ministers on the board. It's just a reflection of the broader interaction with uh, many ministries, uh, many other institutions, and we've mentioned already PAF as an example. But what I would like to point out, and is even more important, uh, coming, coming from a European background and having worked in Germany quite a lot, whenever an initiative was launched, uh, be it by the government or be it by, you know, whatever uh, company that wants to achieve something, then the genuine societal reaction was very much on, oh yeah, up there, they've thought about something, you know, let's, let's, let's have a look at where we can criticize it. I'm, I'm perceiving a complete different situation here. Wherever I go, I mean, I'm now since, since a year and a half, two years based in Neom, but before that I was very frequently in Riyadh, I still come there now every now and then, whoever you talk to, the tech taxi driver, the people in the restaurants that uh, that uh, serve you, but also the recruits. I mean, uh, I have now built up a team of some 100, 120 people in energy, half of them being young Saudis, half of them being international blend from everywhere. They are proud to be part of this. They consider this as theirs. They consider this as their future. That's so different from what I've seen in uh, in some of the countries I've worked in in the past. So, so yes, continuity of leadership is important. The broader involvement of the leadership, government, large companies is important. But also, societal support is very important. Thank you. I want to use that. Do and I, this is where I would encourage the audience leave more questions. We have some great ones. Um, thank you, Michael King, for leaving a question there. But please bring in your questions here, and Sarah will be disappearing shortly for Kyoto. So, um, but I wanna come back around quickly to do a round before we get to Q and A here about, yeah, these points about, okay, so we've talked about the various ways in which greenfield cities fail. How can we make them succeed? And, and Perian brought up, Peter brought up his points about sort of basically how to tie that into leadership. Uh, I am curious about, you know, how do we, uh, or what can we learn about ensuring that these projects reach their, con reach their fulfillment and then have continuity. And, and uh, 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 I'll, I'll start with Goki there because uh, you know it, it, I think in the first chapter of your book, someone actually makes the first reference to uh, Bruno Latour's Aramis, uh, which is one of my favorite books on this, where it was that was the book that made me understand in his uh, exploration of the French experiments in personal rapid transit, that everyone was sort of doing their best to you know make sure the project didn't fail, but no one would take ownership to ensure the project would succeed. And I think Anthony brought this point up earlier. Um, how, do, how do we build cultures or what have you seen the three of you as scholars here in terms of like, what are successful cultures in building greenfield cities? Because it does take an unusual level of integration, leadership and longevity as we've all pointed out here to do this. So do we, do we have a roadmap from these various failures or at least points, you know, key issues that need to be resolved so that if someone is going to underdo, undergo this undertaking besides NEOM uh, in this de next decade to come, how can they succeed? Um, so, uh, okay, I, if, you could, if you could start there, I'm, I'm curious your thoughts on sort of, you know, what, what can we learn from that uh, misadventure? 
Uh, yeah, thank you. That's a difficult question, I think. And, and it uh, basically pushes me to think about what are the sort of the, the aspects of Mazdar City that, uh, that uh, contributed positively to the lives of the people who were part of the project at the time it was happening. And, and I think um, one of the best uh, sort of uh, components of the project was the Mazdar Institute, where, which allowed uh, a sort of an inclusive group of, you know, a diverse group of students to come in uh, on scholarships and to focus on, you know, energy and climate change related questions in a very focused way and where they were given the opportunity to sort of um, both be test subjects in experiments, I guess, but at the same time participate in, participate in experiments that could be um, done at the city scale. And some of those uh, students were uh, re close research collaborators during uh, my time at Mazdar City, but, and I've kept in touch with some of them and I see how they, pursue projects that are they many of them have gone on to pursue PhDs they, they look at um, you know urbanism or uh, climate change or renewable energy related questions on their own and other contexts and so I think um, although perhaps from the perspective of Abu Dhabi or Abu Dhabi's uh, leadership decision makers the Mazdar Institute was supposed to be a sort of like a startup generator that it would have this, you know it would lead to these students to stay in, in Abu Dhabi and to turn Abu Dhabi into a Silicon Valley. Um, perhaps that goal has not necessarily been achieved, but I think there's been a different kind of uh, awareness and different kind of experience generated through the participation of those students to the, to the program. So uh, even if it might not, have, it maybe it didn't necessarily benefit the sort of the um, Abu Dhabi as an emirate or the UAE as a country in the way that it was expected. But perhaps if you think about it globally, I think it had a um, important impact. Thank you, Sarah. I know you have to vanish in just a few minutes here, but so I'm curious. I mean, obviously, at, at the initial version, uh, there were three, of course, of City Quest, which was a new city's uh, uh, convening at King Abdul Economic City to bring together global practitioners for this. Um, you interviewed many of them, and sort of, I remember you taking notes and published several papers on sort of the outcomes of that. So I'm curious, what are the hallmarks of a successful greenfield city, and and particularly from a leadership and project management perspective? What what have we learned, and you know, what would be your advice on for practitioners going forward? Uh, I think my advice would be to get locals involved um, at every sort of level. I think a lot of projects fail when they're just sort of designed for the global jet set. Um, you need buy-in from locals, local, po uh, local populations should be decision makers in these projects, um, and they should be the first to benefit from these projects as well. Um, so sort of slow down and build support rather than a race to construct something in five years. Um, sometimes my, my second piece of advice would be sometimes low tech is actually the best tech. Um, <laughs> a lot of places just can't afford all the bells and whistles and sort of integrated systems and whatnot. Uh, and planting trees and, you know, basic things would actually be really helpful. Uh, and the third one is sort of something that just occurred to me recently is build cemeteries because there are no greenfield cities with cemeteries and it signals that this is a place to, to work for five years and leave. Uh, it's not a place to move, bring your family, establish roots and, and then die there. <laughs> so they keep saying that they want families, they want people settling, but there are no cemeteries anywhere. That's so it's sort of an interesting observation of all the cities I've studied, no cemeteries. That is something I've never considered and will now never, never forget. Um, well, thank you so much, Sarah. I know you have to, to jump. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank you. Uh, Anthony, I'm curious your take on this question as well. Yeah, I mean, I obviously studied sort of the Korean context there and the various levels of stakeholdership. What would be your advice on, you know, how to project manage these through to completion? Yeah, no, I mean, building off something Sarah said in the beginning that a, a lot, of, there's been a lot of disappointment about the, the delivery uh, time for these projects. Um, my experience after Sidewalk, I, I stopped working with Sidewalk around the middle of 2016, and I went uh, to China uh, and worked with a developer there who, um, rather than doing one city of the future over 20 years, which was the, the master plan timeline for Sidewalk, this kind of integrated, beautiful, transformative thing, they wanted to do 10 projects uh, over 10 years, one project a year. They were smaller in scale. Instead of 100,000 people, they were for 10,000 people. But the idea was to develop a roadmap of technologies and technology-enabled services 
that would distinguish those projects and allow them to experiment with big concepts, but also with whether there was demand for that um, and each year to learn. Um, so sort of smaller, faster, breaking down big projects into smaller pieces while still reaching for some of these bigger goals of, of kind of building a new platform. I think that's the secret. And then just to reinforce, like having a genuine narrative that really answers that question of why are we doing this and who cares that isn't aimed solely at investors, because I think most of these projects are really positioned um, for global investors right now. And um, whether it's genuine or not, you know, that whole, that whole other piece of the story is left out. Um, and it makes it very difficult, I think, for, for the public to engage in any meaningful way. Hey, uh, two, two quick uh, questions for you, Peter, before we go to the Q&A here. Um, one is, yeah, can you talk a bit about it? I mean, you know, are you trying to apply agile techniques in the NEOM leadership? I'm curious, like, are you following the classic project management waterfall techniques of very large consultancies there? Or how are you trying to change the management style of that? And second, yeah, you know, is there local stakeholdership involved in this? I mean, there's been news reports, obviously, of conflicts with local landowners of this. You know, one of the one of the hallmarks of Greenfield cities is there's always a temptation to see them as blank slates. But there's, of course, no such thing in this world as a blank slate. So I'm curious from a, from a, again, from a leadership and management standpoint, how are you trying to be more agile? Um, and then also, how are you trying to involve the locals? Yeah, I mean, that, that's, um, that's always a challenge in practice, you know, in, in theory, you can make a lot of good statements, but, but how do you then apply it? And uh, just to give you a, a few, um, uh, we have now, uh, since I think in June, we passed the 1,000 Neomians, as we call them, the people on the ground that built Neom, so not the constructors, but the ones that uh, design, develop, and, uh, and, 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 and make it happen. Uh, and we certainly want to have, and we do have a large participation of Saudis in there. I think we are at 40, 45%. So, so, so that, that's already a good starting point. Yeah, uh, the, the people that build it uh, are to a large degree people from Saudi. The, uh, the other thing that helps, and then I know this is something which as an economist, I always have difficulties in accepting it, but uh, local content. Yeah? So involving local, local companies. Now, and this is not creating a artificial market or do something that is not known in the sense of the great economists, but uh, it needs to happen locally. So a local supplier or a local constructor, if he meets the quality criteria, uh, does have the, ability, the, the, the advantage of proximity. Uh, he's there, he can get his uh, parts, he can get things mobilized, he can get things done quicker. But it also helps in the, uh, in the, the, the local character of what you're building. It helps also involving local communities. Uh, these are just, just two examples. Um, the, the real challenge is in the, uh, on the project management side, because uh, how do you build a country in 10 years? It's just not possible. It's at least not possible with traditional means and also not with traditional project management means. So uh, that already forces us to think differently. I mean, uh, one, one of my leaders uh, sometimes has said, we are building a, something which is as big as the Egyptian pyramids, but they've taken 3000 years to do it and we want to do it in 10 years. So uh, yes, we are looking at parallel development. We're looking at, you know, everything you can imagine of and beyond, but it is basically putting people in a accountable role to make it happen. It was mentioned before, don't uh, search for uh, not making mistakes, but search for people that have the ownership to make something happen. Uh, I think that's the most speedy component of, uh, of getting things done. Thank you. All right, I want to go to the audience question here from Michael King. Uh, what can we learn from the history of integrated infrastructure systems? Where has it been successful? There are examples of, for example, integrated trash removal systems. However, they have not been widely deployed. There, I think of the pneumatic trash system of Songdo in particular. Um, but I want to go first to, to Goki on this because uh, I visited Mazdar in 2019 and I thought it was uh, a bit trenchant that the much hyped personal rapid transit pods, which had dedicated stations and been part of the vision of it, were empty when I was there. 
And roaming around the site were Navia autonomous shuttles that, that we've been seeing in the Las Vegas Strip and elsewhere. So I thought it was an interesting case where a very hard coded piece of infrastructure had perhaps already been had been lapped or, or obsoleted or replaced by uh, you know a piece of tech from elsewhere. And so I, I'm curious, yeah, yeah, how master officials saw themselves in terms of that again that membrane of how much is too integrated versus how much should we let the outside world in, if at all, or, or how they went shopping for global technologies to replace things that had already been built. That's a great question. I think it's uh, one one way of thinking about it is um, well, with the case of the person rapid transit, and I think in our audience we have someone who was involved in the project. So uh, I'd be curious to hear what they think about it too. Is the the uh, the the project was conceived as a sort of a complete infrastructure in the sense that it can only exist with the with the kind of batteries that are there, with the kind of pods that are there, with the kind of uh, let's say the doors that open onto the uh, stations. Et cetera. So it's not, a, let's say, an incomplete infrastructure in the case that you can't necessarily move it from Mazdar, put it somewhere else, and expect it to operate. So, um, so many people. Uh, there were a lot. One of the chapters of my book is basically dedicated to uh, how people uh, saw this integrated infrastructure. Whether did they see it as a failure or did they see it as a success? And one of the ways in which people saw it as a success was they said, you know, well, it takes people from uh, the parking lot to the Mazdar Institute building. And in that sense, it achieves its goal. Uh, it attracts attention to the Mazdar project uh, because it's this, uh, you know, it's this fun, fun thing. It's this exciting kind of a, um, uh, you know, almost like a component of an amusement park. Uh, and, and people described it as an expensive toy. And and others and others would say, well, it can't carry you know crowds. It can't carry uh, you know if there's a lot of if there's a sort of like a, a an event at Mazdar, people end up taking the you know taking those shuttle buses that you saw because they don't want to wait in line necessarily. But at other times, people do wait in line because they just want to experience uh, the person rapid transit pods because it's a fascinating sort of like a, a again it's an expensive toy. So so I think it's interesting to think about where where do you draw the line and what your expectations should be in regards to sort of uh, what kind of infrastructure should be built it's in some some ways people uh, who are part of the uh, Mazdar city project were excited that the sort of the population experiencing the PRT loved it so much uh, and that they saw it as being exotic thing but at the same time uh, how I um, mean, but the, its functionality was uh, became secondary to that fascination. So, so I think that's that's a it's a fine line, uh, I guess. And I think in in the sense, it's one of the questions that was raised earlier in the panel was about sort of uh, will things diffuse outside these smart cities? And it's kind of I guess it's important to decide what. Is it that needs to diffuse beyond? Is it this kind of let's say uh, these um, structures that um, are experimental and that might perhaps work in a sort of a very constrained way, but that might not necessarily be ap applicable at a wider scale? Or is it uh, other kinds of ideas around um, conservation? Or is it more conceptual? What we expect? Uh, basically, what that kind of diffusion do we expect? And, and I think there's something, there's one word that perhaps we never said through the panel, which is politics. And one of the reasons why uh, the person rapid transit pods were important for Mazdar City were, was because they removed the driver from out of the picture. And, and in that sense, they created this environment where the people who were uh, coming to Mazdar would never have to interface uh, with a sort of, with a, with a working class person most likely an uh, immigrant. So the, there's a sort of, a, a, there's an imagination of, uh, you know, the absence of politics in the project, in, in the design of smart cities or in the design of these kinds of cities from scratch. But uh, perhaps it's also important to acknowledge that politics is there and, and there's a specific kind of politics to these cities and, and these integrated infrastructure systems, I think, um, manage to sort of uh, promote those politics or at least are selected because they promote a certain kind of politics. 
No, absolutely. I mean, that's uh, you're absolutely right. That's been, a, of course, a hallmark of particularly the smart city vision of total seamlessness and frictionlessness, which you know removes labor. Of this uh, Adam Greenfield and Shannon Mattern, whose new book, "The City Is Not a Computer," out, all have done great criticism of that. And um, and yes, it's a that's a fascinating point in light of the Gulf. I've always thought of to myself as is where you can see globalization compressed to a handful of meters, where you know labor on our devices is abstracted half a world away. In the case of the states of China, but in the Gulf, you can see the labor that close to you mediated through air conditioning. And glass, and here was an effort to even disintermediate that. Um, with regards to both politics and the integration issue, let's go back to Anthony there, because obviously, you know, sidewalk Toronto context one, I mean, there, there is where, you know, democratic politics particularly intervene in the project. And so I don't know if you have thoughts on, on that again, in the context of how to win over the critics of greenfield cities or even large brownfield cities, but two, again, you know, your thoughts on sort of, you know, you praise the, the high level of thought that went into the systems integration aspect of the sidewalk Toronto plan. Um, I, I'm curious your thoughts on, yeah, the, how, how, again, how do you deploy that at scale or how do you take that model out of there and whether Sidewalk, when you were there, ever thought of it? Because as again, as I noted, it seems like now they want to build, you know, autonomous highways for the state of Michigan. Yeah. They've got a sensors company, Pebble. They've got a, a, a modeling tool replica. It seems like they're, they're breaking apart the project and sort of decentralizing it now. Um, so yeah, I'm no, I mean, I think, I think this question of like, what's the history of integrated infrastructure systems? What do we learn from it? And what, is, what does it look like? Or what does it mean today? These are all... I think it's hard. Um, you know, one of the things I've been learning being on Roosevelt Island at Cornell Tech is that a lot of the ideas about city planning that are very much in vogue today, like car free cities and automated trash chutes and things like that. You know, Roosevelt Island, Philip Johnson's master plan put these things in place in 1974, a year after I was born. Um, and it's been running for 50 years. Um, I'm going to drop a link uh, into the chat, which I think you'll all enjoy after the call, which is a sort of teardown of the automated uh, pneumatic trash system that's in operation. Um, in, in, it's run by the city sanitation department. Um, it's not the most loved piece of infrastructure, but uh, it's only because I think it, it shifts the problems from the curbside uh, to, to the underground um, and allows them to be professionally managed. Now, the question that, that that I think raises um, has to do with public-private partnerships. Infrastructure is getting more complex. Our demands on infrastructure are getting higher, and the amount of money we're willing to pay for it, I think, is, is shrinking. And that has created uh, an opportunity for the private sector to come in and um, you know, deliver a whole range of services and new technologies. Um, and I think that's sort of like the big frontier going forward. Um, and Sidewalk, as you mentioned, has pivoted into that space. There are lots of other companies that have been doing that for, for decades and gone through various cycles of uh, owning the infrastructure, just managing it. So companies like Suez um, and the, uh, some of the transit operators as well. Um, I think that's something that um, is going to really pose some fundamental challenges for governance. And it was the thing that I think in the end killed the sidewalk project that um, very vocal critics, very well organized, were able to um, demonstrate that the public entity responsible for convening and driving the planning agenda had delegated a lot of that to sidewalk and that that was considered unacceptable. Um, that's going to play out very differently in different countries and cultures. Uh, it might have worked in the US had Sidewalk chose to pursue that project in the US. It definitely did not work in Canada and in Toronto. Um, and so I think being sensitive to um, what the value and the, um, the giveaway is when public sector firms come in and take over this layer, really becoming, becoming the master integrator of that smart infrastructure layer is, is really the key to figuring it out. Great. Well, I, we're almost out of time here. And there's a great question, Ramsey, which maybe we can sort of weave in for my panelists to seeing it about uh, the differences between privately developed greenfield cities and public ones. Um, but as a final note for, for, for Goki and, and for Peter is, um, you know, these cities, uh, Mazdar and, and Neon to some extent and others, uh, you know, rely on these sort of private outside firms, Western consultancies. I know in the case of Neon, for example, AECOM and uh, Bechtel have, have been named, Bechtel has been named as the uh, least named consultants on the project. You're coming from a major German energy company. Mazdar was seen, I think, as an example to be a lightning rod to pull an investment from, I believe, Siemens. And I mean, Siemens has a building there and Intel and others. Um, how should we conceive these projects going forward in terms of what is, to your point, Peter, about local content? 
Um, you know, how, how do we create these greenfield cities that are not uh, just purely pieces of global, but do have that sort of local context and can bring in that sort of local leadership? And, and I'm curious, how, you know, how going forward should we try to tread that tightrope of public and private? Um, I know that's a fairly open-ended question here, but, you know, we see this pattern represented that, you know, again, that many, so many of these projects are in efforts to bring in foreign direct investment. They are, uh, as I said, like, like lightning rods put out in the form of, of the built environment. So, um, so yeah, I guess as a final question for you, Goki, was, is, was Mazdar successful in that sense? You know, did it attract FDI? Did it attract foreign expertise and, uh, and sort of plant Abu Dhabi on the map as a, as a leader in clean tech? Uh, I think one of the perhaps, uh, frankly, I don't know the numbers on whether what kind of investment uh, Mazda attracted and how it's transformed in the last ten years. Uh, one of the uh, ways in which the city is seen as successful is because is um, is through its pot potential to create a sort of a non-oil center of energy in in uh, Abu Dhabi. So Abu Dhabi's nuclear project is. Uh, sort of a, is situated there in the city now and IRENA, which is International Renewable Energy Agency has a uh, building there. And so there's a sort of, I guess that, that, that the coming together of those institutions created a sort of the sensibility that there is a sort of a non-oil uh, uh, sort of path uh, in, in the UAE and that can be in Abu Dhabi. In terms of the, uh, the Sort of the presence of Siemens and others, um, I think that has a lot to do with the so Abu Dhabi Sovereign Wealth Fund and the Abu Dhabi Sovereign Wealth Fund has relations with those companies that exist regardless of their investment in um, Mazdar or not. So, so that's, uh, so, so I'm not sure exactly how Mazdar's, uh, um, you know, the, the Mazdar's presence there contributed to the making of or strengthening of relationships with these companies because they were already in it. Um, yeah. Thank you. And then Peter, the last word for you, this, this question also raised in the context because you alluded to it earlier about the fact that, um, which is, you know, a hallmark of the charter city experiment and Niam is again sort of taking this through where it's going to have again in this sense of what Dubai did with the International Finance Center. Uh, it's experimenting in sort of legality and immigration is my understanding of it. Um, so how will Neon become a sort of lodestar for international talent, which you alluded to? It will be able to draw from people and firms from around the world. It will have a special status in that regard within the kingdom there. And I'm, I'm curious your, your thoughts. I know it's a little bit, you know, immigration policy is a little bit outside your scope, but how does that play into your, your seeing the project and the livability aspects and, and everything else in this, because I do think that's really interesting in the sense of it's trying to be somewhat quasi post-national in that regard, which is sort of a culmination of so many of these experiments. Yes, it is. And, uh, and that links into what I've said before. When I talk about local content, I think the most supreme form of local content is what I would call localization. So we don't want local construction companies building something and then going back to Riyadh. We want localization of activities, industry, services, people that uh, um, that sell stuff, not only for Neon, but also for the rest of the world. And, and the first investment that we already announced uh, before we started building a city was the, uh, the largest uh, at scale green hydrogen plant uh, that's ever going to be, that's, that, that, that's, that's being built at the moment. And uh, the amount of hydrogen we produce there is about 200 times what we need for the unit itself. So clearly that's for export purposes, that was also announced. But uh, that is one example that drags on the need of technology. It needs to be maintained, it needs to be repaired, it needs to be improved. And we're clustering a lot of know-how around it with R&D, reaching out to companies like uh, Aram Kusabek with whom we have MOUs to develop green chemicals or green fuels on the back of the green hydrogen that we have. That's a kind of the cascading approach. But as far as what you've mentioned to uh, the policy and how we handle it, I mean, it's also been communicated that NEO will be more than just an economic free zone. It will have its own legal framework, legal context. And that's necessary if what I've said before, uh, innovation doesn't have a passport. Talents and the greatest minds you know, are not restricted uh, to anything. And in fact, diversity is one of the biggest drivers of innovation. And diversity comes by bringing people with a different background together. Of course, also Saudis, but not only Saudis. As one of my bosses uh, uh, said, if you want to have the best people, if they happen to be Saudi, 
thank God, grateful. If not, you know, uh, the purpose of name goes way beyond that. And we think by doing that, we have a pull on activities that uh, enhances the GPDP and that brings value to uh, Saudi beyond what it is doing and what it is able to do today. Great, thank you. Well, with that, we're slowly over time. I want to thank all of my guests for joining and thank you for, uh, for the participants for staying a little bit over. Um, so uh, just to leave us with what our panelists are up to next, uh, I know <laughs> Peter will be working on NEOM for the foreseeable, considerable future. My main takeaway from the session, by the way, is uh, Dr. Moser is it's too soon to tell. We may need several decades. Um, hopefully, uh, we'll have some fresh content for you in the next session of this. I wish I'll come to in a moment. Um, first, thank you, Dr. Townsend. Uh, he's working on an urban tech forecast for Cornell Tech, looking at sort of urban tech trends over the next decade. He did his previous one for the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, Dr. Grinnell, I understand you're working on a new book, uh, looking particularly at sort of uh, infrastructure in Ghana. Uh, and of course, Dr. Moser, who had to leave us, is working on her book, An Atlas of New Cities. So hopefully we'll have a complete list of projects there soon. So I would tell all of our audience members and viewers to look out for those. Uh, as for us at New Cities, we'll be back in person, Delta Variant willing, in a month on September 23rd at the Verizon Executive Education Center in New York at Cornell Tech. Uh, where we're going to have the second installment of the Greenfield Cities Alliance Dialogues on sustainable urban mobility systems of the future. Um, so we're going to particularly tease apart that piece uh, that Niam is working on with their The Line, which imagines uh, an extreme form of urbanism for sustainability in which all development is scaled across a single line, hundreds of kilometers, combining high-speed rail along its trunk and hyper -local local nodes along, uh, strung along. Um, so we're going to explore some of those issues about are there new urban forms that can be designed more sustainably given the combination of active mobility, walking, and new forms of technology. So we hope to see some of you in New York then and also more of you online. Um, it's been a pleasure. Thank you all again. And we'll be back very soon with the second installment of the Greenfield Cities Alliance Dialogues. <laughs>